Hi there, YouTube. I'm back again today for another game review. Today, I'm very excited to check out Smiths of Winterforge from Passport Game Studio and Rule and Make. This is for two to five players with an asterisk. Age is 14 plus. It'll take about 20 minutes per player to play. And in Smiths of Winterforge, you're going to be taking control of your own guild of dwarves or miners or whatever they are. And you're going to be forging various different pieces of jewelry, weapons, and clothing and as you do that you're going to progressively get better at doing that and the hope is to gain victory points by collecting resources forging those resources hiring different people taking out loans doing a couple different things like that now there's a lot in this base box and i said there's an asterisk on two to five players because there's also a solo version of the game and a six player version of the game and the game comes with four built-in expansions that you can add into the game there's a lot in this box as such the middle part is longer than i like to it's at 13 minutes, so fair warning on that. Try to cover a lot in it, but let's open this bad boy up and see if it's all worth it. Right then, we're gonna take a look at what you're gonna get inside of Smiths of Winterforge. So first and foremost, we have a handy dandy rule booklet, 16 pages, double sided, full color, full of pictures, illustrations, examples. It's very well done. I think there was only maybe one or two minor rule questions we had, but we were able to figure them out. And uh, actually, you're only gonna need the first 12 pages because the last four pages are if you want to play six players solo or play with the built-in expansions and then the quick reference. So overall, big thumbs up on the rule book. Uh, also, there's a each player eight cards. Everybody's going to get one of these, and they are spectacularly done for the base game. They don't have anything about the expansion, which is unfortunate. Uh, but for the base game, wow. Spectacular, spectacular player aid cards. I want to mention before I forget them. So in Smiths of Winterforge, you're going to be taking control of a guild. And this is going to be your guild right down here. We'll go over all the different stuff on here. You are going to try to get the most points by forging uh, basic goods or forging your big good. Everyone's going to have one big good, which will get you five points. It'll get you even more points if you are the first person to make it. And... That is also one of the triggers to the end of the game. So if someone is able to forge one of their big, big, big things, or when this entire stack runs out, that will be the end game trigger, at which point everyone will get the same number of returns, and then the game will be over. So let's go over the components, then we'll get into the gameplay, because that, of course, is actually a pretty simple uh, worker placement, worker movement game, I should say, unless you're playing six players. Talk about that later. So... The start of the show is really going to be your board right down here. And this is going to be kind of your hub where you're keeping track of everything. So first, you're going to have spots where you're going to be putting your cubes in here. This is your experience making either weapons, uh, clothing, or uh, jewelry. And as you forge more, you're going to get better at doing them. So for instance, uh, in this particular game, I would start at one right here, and I'd start at one right here. What does that mean? Well, that means when you're trying to make something, for instance, I, if I wanted to make this pair of gauntlets, uh, I, it would be one easier. So instead of taking a 12, it would only take an 11. And then if I was here, it would take a 10, a 9, an 8, a 7, a 6, a 5, a 4. So as you can see, as you progress down this track, it's going to get easier and easier to make one of the three different types of things. Also, when you craft something, you get to automatically move up one because you're a little bit more experienced. So if I made these gauntlets, I would go from one to two automatically. You also can pay to move yourself up on this track. If you go to a certain spot, one of the uh, work placement spots, which I'll tell you a little bit about later, then you can pay three bucks to move up here, and then five bucks to move into here, and then ten bucks to move up to here. Also, at the bottom, at the end of the game, if you are in any one of these spots, you're going to get two points, and any one of these spots, you're going to get three points. So if you could get all the way up to here, which would be really difficult, um, unless you're really focusing on it, or got really lucky, you're going to get yourself uh, nine points, which is huge. Over here is where you keep your debt, because you can take debt in this game. And unlike a lot of games, uh, debt is a perfectly viable strategy. You can take out loans, and as long as you pay back those loans, you'll be just fine. In fact, if you pay back your loans, you even get a point. But if you don't pay back your loans, then you're going to lose two points. Down here is where you keep your crew. You're going to be able to hire up to two members of a crew. And if you have two crew down here at the end of the game, you'll get two points. But you are going to have to pay your crew whenever you forge because, you know, they're helping you. Last but not least, you have a spot over here where you're going to be able to keep your, uh, your already made cards because once you complete them, you'll put them face down here. <clears throat> and that's how you're going to be able to count your points at the end of the game. So <clears throat> that's your main board. Let's talk about the main board. 
and the different spots you're gonna be able to do. And surprisingly, there's only one, two, three, four, five spots in the base game. Now there are four additional spots that come in the box, which we'll talk about later. These are expansion places you can go to, which I do highly recommend checking out, potentially even on your first game for some of them. Um, but let's talk about the five different spots and what you're gonna be able to do there. So you start the game on the guild hall. And you'll notice that there's spots here, but in most of the time you're actually gonna be down at the bottom. This is what's called a prime spot. So if you've ever played Puerto Rico or a lot of other different games, you'll be familiar with this. If you're at the prime spot at a location, one time you're able to take an action, it'll be like kind of a super action where you'll get an additional bonus. So in the guild hall, you can take two cards from the row up here. And these are gonna be uh, contracts that you're gonna try to complete. At the beginning of the game, you'll probably want low numbered contracts because let's talk about how the contracts work. In order to complete this contract, you have to have at least one stone and one gold. You'll be able to get the gold and the stone over here at the marketplace. And on these cards, it will show you what kind of dice you're pulling. So if I had this piece of silk, uh, I'd be rolling a d6. And if I had uh, this piece of leather, I would be rolling two d6s in order to try to complete this. So let's pretend I was actually trying to complete this. I'd have a d6, a d6, and then since I have leather, which is really fortunate, see how it says leather there, I get plus two, so I automatically only need 10. Now since I would be at one right here on this track, I only need to get a nine. So if I actually went to the forge district and tried to do this, I'd be rolling two d6s in order to get a nine, pretty much. <clears throat> Well, that's how forging works. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But this is what you're, where you can go to get these cards. You'll be able to get up to two of the cards. You can only ever have three in your hand at any one time. Uh, and you'll start the game with a one-point contract. And you'll also start the game with one big contract. This big contract does not count towards your limit of three. You also can just beg for money here. If you have less than three bucks, then you can get one buck. It's not a particularly great option unless you're really hard up for cash. Now, if you're in the prime spot, then you'll get one additional dollar if you take either of those actions. So that's the guild hall. That's where you're going to get more cards and sometimes get money if you're super broke. Moving down to here, and you see there's an arrow, and that does take one of your actions to move. We'll talk about the actions a little bit later. You go to the banking district. The banking district is where you're going to get a loan. There's two types of loans. This one, uh, you'll borrow six bucks, you have to repay ten bucks. And this one, you'll borrow eight bucks, you have to repay 12 bucks. It's a great way to get your engine up and churning with the game. And also, if you're in the prime spot, then you'll get one additional dollar if you are taking out a loan and you'll lose, you'll only have to pay $2 less if you're paying back a loan. So those are great places to get the prime spot because it's gonna save you money in the long run. Next, if you're in the market district, you have the option to buy two of these cards out here. And there's level one cards, there's level two cards, and there's level three cards. Uh, generally how it works is if you're buying a one cost card, you'll be rolling a D4 on your turn. If you're rolling a two cost card, you're gonna be rolling a D6 on your turn. If you're rolling a three cost card, you're gonna be rolling a D8 on your turn. If you're rolling a four cost card, you're gonna roll a D10. And if you're rolling the uh, five cost cards, or excuse me, a D12, not a D10, then you'll get yourself a D12 and a D4, but those are gonna cost you five bucks. They're very, very expensive, but they can be worth it, uh, especially if you need to do that. If you're in the prime spot, you can get three cards instead of two cards, and there's no limit to how many cards that you can have of these. Next, we'll head over to the Tavern District, and the Tavern District is where you're going to be able to hire someone. If you're in the Prime Spot, you'll be able to hire them for one less, but these are going to be a whole bunch of persistent special abilities that you'll get as long as you pay for them. Uh, so, for instance, this guy, the Transporter, once per turn, you may pay one coin to perform an extra move action, which is huge, because you only get three actions on your turn. So this essentially is giving you one extra action each turn. You may purchase an extra component on your first purchase, first purchase purchase action each turn. So essentially you're going to be able to purchase four here if you're in a prime spot and if you have the money. Uh, the negotiator, your contracts earn plus three when completed. Uh, there's some that will make you, oh that one's for the expansion. Uh, the diplomat, each turn replace the cost of the first component you purchase by one. So they're going to give you really cool special abilities. But the catch is when you complete a, when you forge something, here at the Forge District, the last spot we haven't talked about yet, you're going to have to pay them one coin a piece when you do that. So they're going to stick with you, and they're going to make you better, but you are going to have to pay them, and that means there's less money to spend at other places. But still, really cool options there, and a whole bunch of these cards. Last but not least, we have the Forge District. And the Forge District has two additional actions. Uh, the one that most of the time people don't use terribly often is to upgrade your skill track. 
as I mentioned, here's your skill track. You could pay the money and boop, you could go move your cube over one space. The primary reason people come here is to forge their contract. So let's go back to this uh, 12 we had right here. And let's pretend we did have the, uh, what, what do we have? We had gold, we had leather and silk. So we would reveal all these cards when we were here. And if we were in the prime spot, we'd automatically get to put a plus one on there, which means now we only have to get an 11. Uh, since we have leather, we're up to nine. And since we're one on our little track down here, we're up to an eight. So all we have to do is roll an eight on these two dice to collect the rewards. So let's see if we did it. We did not do it, which is unfortunate, but all is not lost. Everything stays right here. Everything stays put. These components are locked to this, but I do get to put an additional one for failing. So if I had another action, I could say I'm going at it again, and now it only needs seven, and I got it, which means I successfully completed the contract. What does that mean? Well, that means these go away. I've used them to forge this. These go away. Uh, and now I get myself eight gold, which I can use to buy various different things, or, and, excuse me, not or, and I also get two victory points at the end of the game, and my gaunt, my ability to produce... Uh, clothing has went up by one. So those are all the actions you're going to take. And on your turn, you're going to take three actions. So maybe you'll move, take an action, move one more time, or maybe you'll take the same action two times at a place and then move to a different place. But that's it. You're going to take three actions, a very straightforward game at that point once you know what all the actions do. And as I mentioned, this player aid card is absolutely spectacular. It tells you in detail all the different actions in the game there's even some free actions you can take they're listed on here as well uh shows you how to forge a contract really spectacular player aid card so now let's talk about the stuff that we have not talked about yet which is the four additional built-in expansions yes these are not uh these are just something that comes with the game that you can add if you would like to and i think most people are going to want to add them so first we'll start with the shrine, and this one's really kind of simple. You're going to go here, you're going to pay two coins, and then you're going to draw one of these little tokens right here. It's either going to have a one, a two, or a three on it. Hooray, this one's a three. Whoever at the end of the game has the most points based on, oh, these is going to get three points, which is a good chunk of points. Um, so if you're the only person doing it, it's an easy way to get three points. Second place is going to get you two points. It's probably my least favorite of the four modules, to be honest with you. Next, we have the Runesmith. You're going to go here, you're going to spend two bucks, and then you will get one of these fancy cards right here. And these fancy cards will give you various different special abilities. Increase the gold value of this contract by three. So, essentially, that just got you a coin, but it did take you an action. This one, increase the... Well, pfft, that's the same one. Uh, this one, gain an additional skill point when this contract is forged. So they're going to allow you to do different things. Some of them will give you dice. Uh, some of them will do all sorts of different things. Really like that addition to the game. Last but not least, uh, excuse me, not second to last but not least, we have the Auction House, which is probably my favorite one. It's a little bit of a push-your-luck aspect. So normally when you complete uh, a contract, you just get the stuff right there. When you complete a forge, you just get the stuff and you're on your merry way. But that, this one, you actually have the option to take that to the Auction House. You roll a D12 and you could potentially gain more money or less money for completing the contract because you're taking it to auction. And that is obviously high risk, high reward. So I uh, really like that addition. Last, we have the Thieves Guild, which will allow you to spend two bucks and rob someone. Uh, this means you're going to randomly take one card away from them which could be a potentially a five cost card or it could be a one cost card you never know what you're going to get it sounds like it might be a broken spot we actually thought that when we thought that because like we're always just going to steal stuff but you have to take the action you have to go there and how this works is you set all these tiles over off to the side and it just costs one action to move to them and one action to move back they're called the alleyways really cool that it's included with the game but there's more! There's event cards. Because yes, you can also play this as a solo game. And the solo game, spoiler alert, is pretty good. And it's a good way to learn the game as well. And it's going to have you dealing with random events that will come into play. And there is a scoring system that will tell you how well you did based on uh, the score that you get. Last but not least, there's even a way to play with six players, which will have you, instead of moving around, it takes away the movement action. And it also kind of uh, messes with the primary action a little bit, where you can only have one person in a primary spot. But you're going to have three workers and it's just a straight up worker placement game instead of moving you'll just be placing your workers out on the board taking the action for the most part the game is the same a little bit but it takes away the uh, the movement actions which actually does kind of speed up the game you'd think that it's going to be way way longer at six players but taking away the movement action essentially gives you three direct actions each turn as opposed to one or two movement actions which you'll normally take one or two movement actions on your turn but this is the kind of stuff i should be talking about the pros and the cons so that in a nutshell whoo that's what you're going to be doing in smith's of winterforge
Orion Smiths of Winterforge. What are my final thoughts? Let's go with the pros. Let's go with the cons. First, on the con side, the game's not going to be for everybody for a variety of reasons. If you're not a fan of worker placement games, this one might not be for you. Now, while technically it is a worker movement game, I actually think that's kind of worse if you're not a fan of worker placement games because it adds the tedious aspect of moving physically from location to location as opposed to just placing your worker down. Now, that being said, if you're playing the six-player version of the game, then it does turn into a pure worker placement game. Um... And there's a lot to cover in this game. I am going to be contradicting myself a good deal when I'm going over these cons and saying, well, but if you're doing this, then, then it won't happen. Continuing on, the game can be somewhat repetitive if you're not using the four expansions that will allow you different ways to score points and different things you can do. What I mean by that is get components, forge contracts, get new contracts, get components, forge contracts, get components, forge contracts, maybe hire somebody, potentially get a loan here or there. You're going to be doing the same actions over and over and over and over and over again. So I wish maybe there was more actions in the base game, but that being said, they include in the base game four additional expansions you can use. So if you're using the expansions, then you can kind of ignore that because I do feel that the expansions add enough to the game to give you more choices and more different paths to victory. Whereas the base game, while I still think it's a great base game on its own, does feel somewhat limited in scope in different ways you can win the game. Um, Continuing on with the cons, there's a lot to take in at first. This is a simple game, and I want to stress that. This is not a terribly difficult game, but there's a lot to take in when you're first teaching this game because you have to get the concept of the three actions. and When does this replenish? When does that replenish? Does it replenish after your turn? Does it replenish after your action? Oh, this is a free action, but it costs you a dollar. Then why do they call it a free action? Because it doesn't actually cost your action point, but it costs you a dollar. There's a lot of that sort of little things in there because there's a lot of moving parts in this game. That being said, the player aid card helps exponentially and the rules are well done, but still it can be daunting. And this is by no means a gateway game and by no means a heavy, crunchy, thinky game. That being said, there can be some analysis paralysis in this game, especially when it comes to components. Because what I've seen some people try and do is forge two contracts or, dear God, three contracts at one time. And when you do that, you really have to be thinking about which components you're getting, what probability you're going to have. You have to be looking down at your board and looking at this and looking at that. And it creates downtime between turns, especially at four and five players. Now, I really like this game at four and five players. I'm not going to tell you it's a bad game at four or five players, but I will say, especially at five players, also at four players, there's downtime between turns as you take all three of your actions at one time. And um, I don't really think there's anything you can do about it, to be honest with you because it's kind of essential to the function of the game. But at five players, I will say I did see people busting out phones in between turns because there was so much downtime between those turns, especially if you have analysis paralysis. Um, any other cons that I have with the game? I wish there was maybe a little bit more variability in the components. Well, it is cool that the components, sometimes you can sync them up with the contracts and they'll give you special bonuses, but I think it'd be cool if there was some, some like a really good one or like some, something where if you actually rolled a one with it, it, it just crumbled, or if you rolled a 12 with it, then you could reuse it or a six with it. If you rolled like a natural D4 or something, then you could reuse it. I think that would just add a little bit extra to the game. And if they would come out with another expansion that's not in the base box, obviously, uh, I would love to see just some different components that maybe mix things up because I really hope this game does well because spoiler alert, it's a really great game. Not just a great game, a really great game. Any other cons that I have with the game? No. Moving on to the pros. Smiths of Winterforge. It's a really great game. And this is probably going to one of my, uh, probably going to go in my top 10 games of the year, I do think. Because there is so much in this box and there's so much to like about this. So first and foremost, I want to stress that I really like the base game. I think the base game is a great game on its own. I think three players is the sweet spot maybe four players uh that being said i liked it five players i liked it two players i tried the solo version i like that i don't think i'd go back to that because it is just kind of a uh, beat your high score kind of thing oh how did you do based on your score uh but i did like it and the six player version of the game is good it takes away the movement action which i actually think uh sped up the game a little bit from the five player version to the six player version which doesn't happen terribly often now that could be because my first time playing it was a five player game and i think uh it was probably like uh, my fourth time playing it when i played the six player version of the game so i knew the rules and i was better at teaching them but i also think it sped up the game a little bit because it's, it takes away the movement it's just action 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 um but hey uh, i'm curious to know what you guys think if you played the game
So, what else did I like about the game? I love the fact that it comes with the four built-in expansions. And this makes it an instant recommendation for me. It was a great game before, and this makes it a very great game, because these do add variability. These do add some different ways to score points. Uh, some people are not going to like the Thieves Guild. I will say that. I've had somebody get totally triggered because they spent five on one of those uh, the diamonds that gives you like a 12 and a 4. And somebody came over with two bucks and stole it. And they were like, <gasps> you just ruined all my plans. And that can happen. And... That's another thing. That's another comment I have with this game. There's not too much player interaction in this game without the expansion, without the Thieves Guild. Because most of the time, yeah, oh, you blocked me out of taking the prime action or something like that. That's, that's pretty much the extent of the player interaction. This adds, like, direct take that player interaction, which feels somewhat out of place, but I still like it. And, and I will always play with these. After the first game... Uh, I played with these every single time, and I plan on playing with these in the future as well. They're very easy to add in. Uh, they only have one action apiece, whereas all the other spots normally have two actions you can take there, so they are pretty simple. Really, really like these. Really like these. Uh, components, very nice components. Player aid card is spectacular. Rules are well done. Um... I feel like there's enough different paths to victory to make me happy. Uh, I've won on a stand-up die roll. I've won by nickel and diming and make really, really cheap stuff. I've won by, you know, launching something all the way up to uh, the, the highest thing. Well, I, I've not won, but other people have won. I've won twice. Um, and I like that. I like that there's different, different ways to win the game. And I like the fact that you can just throw a Hail Mary and be like, all right, I'm going to try and craft this master thing. My last turn, I need to get I need to get a six on this die, an eight on my eight-sided die, and I need to get a nine. Or, you know, I like that aspect. And I like the fact that when you fail a contract, it's not the end of the world. In fact, you get a little bit better at doing it next time. I think that's a really cool concept. I think there's a lot of really cool concepts in this game. And in the end, Smiths of Winterforge is a recommendation for me. Very great game. Uh, one that's going into my collection and uh, big fan of this one. I'm ex I hope I hope that they come out with some more stuff in the future to this uh, to make it even better. But as it stands, still a very great game. That is Smiths of Winterforge. If it looks like it might be a cup of tea. Be sure to check this one out. If you're enjoying what I'm doing, please be sure to click on that subscribe button down below. And in the comments below, let me know. Have you ever forged anything? Um, no. No, I haven't. Of course not. Who does that? Hey, do you? Let me know in the comments below. Terrible question. As always, thanks for your time, YouTube.